So chapter five, we touched on, um, we started talking about chapter five is tissues. This test again is chapter one and three, which is most of it, and chapter five and six are included in that. The bulk of stuff is going to come from cells. Bulk of it's going to come from the, the basic stuff of the chapter one. Do you know your directional terms, body planes, some of the cavities, that stuff. Um, and then a lot of the rest of it's going to come from three, where it's the cells, cellular transport stuff. And I'd say the minor chapters is five and six as far as content goes, because a lot of the stuff will touch again. But that's the majority. So chapter five, we started talking kind of page, it's 75, I think, where it starts. We talked about that all of us start off as a stem cell from conception. A bunch of stem cells are the specialized cells we humans have that, and other animals have them, that can multiply a lot, can replicate. Then we talked about epithelial tissue. Remember, there's four types of tissue in the body. Epithelial is one. Anybody remember another one? Connective. What's another one? Nervous and... Muscular, okay? Those are the four main types, and there's always going to be subcategories in that. Epithelial is one of them. It has a lot of subcategories. I highlighted kind of the two biggest distinctions on page 77. Like basically simple epithelium, where are you going to find that? Anybody remember? Without looking at your book. Simple, si nope. Simple single cell layered epithelium. Nope. Simple means it has like single layer. It attaches, so a basement, so you're on, the, you're on the right track. So a base, what it says is the definition of simple epithelium is something that attaches to a basement membrane. All a basement membrane is is saying it attaches directly to whatever that connective tissue is. So I'll give you, I'll throw you the other way. Skin is stratified. Stratified was like stacks upon stacks of cells. So there is a layer of our skin that attaches to the basement membrane that's connective tissue, but we've got stacks upon stacks of cells on top of that, which makes sense because if we didn't, your skin needs to have some layers and thickness to it. If we just barely brushed us, we'd bleed or have injury. That gives us the ability to kind of bump something and not bleed to death. So if that's stratified. Simple, we're going to find in places where we need uh, particles or molecules to equally, uh, equally easily flow across. That would be like your... Blood vessels, the really small blood vessels. Uh, your lungs, most of that area epithelium is very thin so that those like oxygen molecule can get through easily. That's where you thought thin. So on page 77 has a giant chart of all of our epithelium. I highlighted the first one of simple and the first one of stratified to give you like, these are, where, these are the big ones you'll find in a lot of places. But mostly epithelium you think of uh, mucous membranes, places that touch the outside of our body. So skin in our mouth, our nasal cavity, um, our esophagus, where stuff gets roughed up a lot, we're going to want epithelium. Um, and then all epithelium usually has a basement membrane, and all a basement membrane is is what we're talking about next, connective tissue, where it connects to. Um, other than that, the other unique thing about epithelium is that epithelium is the type of tissue that makes up our glands. And glands would be like our hormone glands in our body that secrete certain hormones. They would also be glands like sweat glands. Anything that, a gland is just something that secretes some kind of substance for us, okay? And epithelium tissue typically is what makes up our glands. That's the kind of big points with epithelium. So connective was the more complicated one I said to look at because it's so multi-layered. And I'll spend some time today mainly just trying to make sure we kind of understand. Again, the big thing with all the tissues is the big four and then you need to divide those into some subcategories and you know where to find them. That's the big thing. So the big four tissues, the subcategories of each, and then like where in the body do I find these, okay? So connective tissue you find everywhere, but the book's kind of defining it. It uses this word here at the very top of page 79, this extracellular matrix. There it goes. Framework, okay? So extracellular matrix is just a word the book is using to, for connective tissue to say it's outside a cell and it's all, again, connective tissue is made of cells, but it's saying it's extracellular. It's addition to other cells to help connect. So like imagine pretty much every other tissue type we talk about, right? So our skin is mostly epithelial cells and that type of tissue, but it connects to a basement membrane. That basement membrane is some kind of connective tissue connecting to everything else. 
Things like our muscles. Our muscles help us move our bones and keep our posture. But those muscles have to attach somehow to bones, or they have to attach different places. What attaches them? Connective tissue, okay? So every other, basically, that's why connective tissue, the book highlights it as the most uh, widespread uh, and most abundant or most varied. So it's the most different types and it's the most you can find everywhere, okay? From your head down to your toes, it's everywhere. Because basically all of those other three tissue types are going to be touching connective tissue at some point. Your muscle, um, uh, uh, your nervous tissue, and epithelium are all at some point going to have to meet up with a connective tissue somewhere. And that's why it gets that name connective, okay? At some point, that's where they're going to, they, that's how they attach to the body and stay where they're supposed to stay is the connective tissue. And so it's an extracellular matrix because it's like a framework. It's a, different types of protein fibers and a, 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 a material called collagen and elastic fibers. It's made of like fibers and stuff that like glues stuff together. Imagine like your Gorilla Glue for your body, gluing all our other tissues together, okay? So it doesn't matter that you know so much about the different fibers. Just think of connective tissue as this fibrous type of tissue that's all about connecting the other three types of tissue to each other. And so there's lists on page starting on 79 all the way through 81 that give you kind of uh, here's this and that. And I'm going to try to like look at it as a big picture. Um, I try to anyway. So what I'll probably do is I'll go back and forth between this slide. I'll stay on this slide probably. So our big one is connective. There's a big one. We can do some other colors after that. I don't know. We'll figure it out as we go. So this is, again, this is how my, my mind, I subdivide it to make sense of it. Because I think 79 and page 80, they do a good job of describing these tissues, but it doesn't help you understand their organization. What category? So again, all of these tissue types, we just saw epithelium has some subcategories. I told you just kind of think of them as subdivide epithelium into glandular is kind of its own thing, and then stacks of, of stratified epithelium and then simple epithelium. There's a bunch of stuff in between, but that's the big. So again, we're trying to look at the big picture of connective. I can divide connective into these, basically these big four categories of fibrous connective tissue, cartilage, uh, blood, and bone are all fall under connective tissue. They're falling underneath that category. So let's kind of look at them as we go. Page 79 talks about it. So I'm gonna kind of use this chart and go through the slides and come back to it, hopefully. Maybe. Eh, I need to move it, I guess. Let me try to, I'm going to, I'm trying to position this where we can use it the whole time. Is this all going to move together? Probably not. That would have been too much to ask. Oh, the F. I need to learn how to write Fs. Goodness. Oh, shoot, fire. Struggle bus, Monday. It's Monday for everybody, okay? My joke used to be, I'm the conductor of the struggle bus. Okay, so. Down there on 79, it's, it breaks up this fibrous connective tissue into two categories, loose and dense. So loose has three subtypes underneath that. And they're in colors on 79. They're in like a reddish color background a yellow, and then like a purplish color. And that's areolar, is how you say that, not areola. Areolar is, areola is a nipple, okay? Just if you want to know. Areolar is a connective tissue. Areolar, adipose, and reticular. They break it up into those three. So the difference is really kind of what they connect and what they're made out of. Areolar is very elastic and kind of rubbery. It's made up of collagen and elastic fibers, so it's very like rubbery. And usually areolar is about connecting different structures. It's the main one that's helping us connect. So 
that basement membrane, the bottom membrane of our um, epithelium typically is going to connect to areolar tissue. Around blood vessels, it's around nerves. Um, it's usually areolar is the more common attachment connective tissue. It's really the common attachment, connect, attaching these other tissues to other things. And that's areolar. So we go back, we say, okay, Fibrous has its own categories of loose and dense connective tissue. So right now we're talking about loose. What color did it use? It used red. Okay. So we're talking about areolar. Again, this is how I think of it. We'll think of it this way. I don't think I'm spelling that right. Uh, are yeah. Oh, areol. Areolar. So areolar is uh, fiber, rubbery, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of words that would help you think of it. Connects most other tissues. So when I'm doing this, I'm trying to help you when you're studying to think of it this way. If I start just right summarizing stuff in shorthand there's areolar kind of summarize what it does again you could talk about it the book mentions that there are soft gel like matrix fine pick the words out from the book that make sense to you on your head okay so the other loose connective tissue it highlights is adipose dominated by fat cells so this is not working like i hoped but it is what it is so dominated by fat cells, that's adipose tissue. And again, this is all in your book in 79. Fat cells. So yeah, in the lipid family, I know you, some people may not be able to see yellow. Um, look, that's not right. Adipose is what you call it. Adipose tissue. So it's mostly fat cells. Um, what's, I mean, that's mostly what I think of it as. So what does adipose do for us? Well, adipose is usually going to be underneath stuff. So adipose acts like protective. It'll be underneath their skin. It acts like a protector, OK? So if someone, you know, says something about your weight, you just say, I'm just protecting my vital organs. I just care about my vital organs more than you, okay? No, I'm just, I don't know. I'm trying to make myself feel better. All right, so fat tissue is more, is a lot about protection. It's padding, okay? It's going to kind of keep our vital organs safe. So that's why a lot of us have a predominant amount of adipose tissue around our stomach, um, around the backside, protecting our kidneys. So fat tissue is usually about protection, and one other thing that's really big about fat tissue that people don't remember all the time is actually energy storage. So I could ask you a question. Some of you might know this. If I put a man and a woman on a desert island and gave them no food, who's going to starve to death the fastest? The man. Why? Sorry, ladies. Women have more fat tissue than men. It's just genetically, statistically. So fat tissue is energy reserves. That's why it's quicker for men to lose weight. Typically, it has a lot to do with genetics. And again, a lot of the fat reserves for women is geared towards childbearing. It takes a lot of energy to you know, grow a human. Um, so a lot of those fat reserves go to that. It just depends. But yeah, I mean, it, it has a lot to do with that. It has something to do with that. I think it has a little bit to do with metabolism and hormones are involved. It's multifaceted, but typically, yeah. But either way, that's what fat storage does. Fat does that for us. And that's why, like, that's why babies, when they come out, babies are not very, they're very lean. Now, a baby a couple months in, right, becomes a chunk and they get rolls and stuff like that. But when they come out, right, babies don't, okay, there are a few exceptions to that rule. But typically, babies, okay, we're, talk, we're not talking about 12-pound world record babies here, okay? We're talking about normal 7, 8-pound babies, 6-pound babies, whatever, that range. Uh, 
they're going to come out very lean and they have trouble regulating their temperature. They have trouble with energy and they always have to eat like every two hours. Why? They don't have the fat storage for energy like an adult does or even an older baby. They need that constant energy from their food sources, those calories. So fat cells offer some protection, energy storage, and they actually do uh, do something. Adipose tissue is great at uh, what's the heat conservation, basically. Conserving heat. So again, if someone says something about your weight, you just say, I'm gearing up for the winter. Fight you. No, okay. Right? I'm trying to stay warm, okay? You'd be all cold with your skinny butt. All right, so heat con conservation, conserving heat. So a reason I'm sticking on adipose tissue so long is adipose is just another connective tissue. Usually it's somewhere along the lines of areolar. It's going to help connect stuff. But you can see fat tissue actually has a lot of different really vile kind of functions to us, right? You see this? So obviously it's not a bad thing to lose some weight and be healthy, but we're always going to have to have some fat tissue somewhere. And even the most lean person that's like, whatever, 3% body fat, that's, they still have some body fat, you know. So there is a positive to it. But the fat cell's main three things is protection, energy storage, heat uh, cons conservation or conserving heat. And they actually get that energy. A lot of times what fat stores is glucose. They store glucose as energy, which is great for burst of energy. Um, but it's not what we want all the time. So that's why there's a, a balance where you don't want too much fat because that glucose is not the optimal thing we use for energy, but it is a great source of it. It's just not what we want to use long term. Okay, the last loose one is called reticular, and this one's way more rare. Reticular is the last loose connective tissue. I think they did purple in the book, I think is what it is, on that little chart on the 79. Yeah, so... The last one here is reticular. And this one is a little more rare and found um, only in a few places. Mainly they talk about it being the framework of the spleen. But it's a network of fi loose fibers, basically. It's not like spongy, like areolar. very loose. Um, let's see, yeah, lymph nodes, bone marrow, or spleen. That's where you kind of find these. Again, fat you can kind of find a lot of places around the stomach, backside. So spleen, bone marrow, lymph nodes. And it has to do with these, these organs and these structures can be like spongy enough, but like have a lot of space for things to happen. So our spleen is very vascular, has a lot of blood vessels and a lot of areas for our immune cells to like mature. Lymph nodes hold a bunch of immune cells and our lymph nodes are pretty squishy and they need to be. They're mostly reticular tissue along with other tissues, of course. And then bone marrow is actually this tissue. It's kind of loose squishy but of course bone marrow is encased in bone which we'll talk about bone next that's our next unit of information but bone is basically as hard as uh, uh, titanium so on the outside but if it has bone marrow on the inside it's loose and spongy so that it can manipulate it can grow and move and do what it's supposed to do basically that's reticular so the three loose is areolar found kind of everywhere rubbery connects most other tissues. Uh, adipose is fat cells. They are for protection, energy, keeping us warm. Reticular is more rare, found mainly in lymph nodes. Our spleen is a network of just fibrous, loose, connected fibers, basically. So dense connective tissue is discussed at the bottom of that page, page 79. Got to come up with a different color. So dense connective tissue. Anyone shout out what these are? Tendons and ligaments. There's your dense.
So really what these guys do, the main role for these guys is to connect our bones to bone and muscle to muscle. So it talks about in the first page there, um, there are cord-like structures. Cord, I would say, is like you ever had a, a bunch of rubber bands maybe or like a few of them and you kind of stretch. They're kind of like that in a sense. They're like a stretchy rubber band cords that attach, attach these to each other. So it tells us which one attaches what there, and I think that's a good need to know for your future so you don't get that mixed up. I still get it mixed up sometimes, but tendons are attaching muscle to bones. Ligaments attach bone to bones. So tendons, muscle to bone. Got to smell muscle right. Sorry, what's that? No, we're doing ten at the bottom of page 79. It talks about dense connective tissue. We're still talking about dense, which is just tendons and ligaments. That's all dense is. Muscle to bone for tendons, ligaments connect bone to bone. I think that's a good distinction to know, okay? Now, typically, if you guys have ever injured a joint before, hi, what's that? Mm -mm. No, you can. Miss Carolyn, you're getting borrowed. Uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, tendons connect muscle to bone, ligaments bone to bone. Typically, if you mess a joint up right, you're going to probably hurt both of these things or strain both these things or sprain both these things because they're all kind of in the same area in a joint. Um, but not always. It just a ton of depends. The unique thing about these that I want to make the point of is that, uh, yeah, the next sentence after that first one on the page is, unlike other connective tissues, which have rich blood supplies, dense connective tissue have few blood vessels. You see that? So the other point with these is to say, I'm why I'm doing colors because we're going to run out of room. Few blood vessels. Now, if you know anything about our body, I've mentioned already, blood is our highway. Okay? Blood gets stuff everywhere. You have a question? Okay, what's the question? Both. Okay. Dense connective tissue as a whole, tendons or ligaments. Tendons or ligaments are very similar in their structure. It's just one is dedicated. They just named them differently because one is only found attaching muscle to bone and one's only found attaching bone to bone. But as far as their connective tissue structure, they're both just stretchy, fibrous, dense connective tissue. Because they're so dense, they're not... There's like packed tightly of these fibrous tissues. And I've seen them. Like I've seen a ACL repair and stuff. We actually have synthetic tendons and ligaments we can actually make and then cut to length and hammer into the bone. It's kind of interesting. Um, but it looks just like a rubbery Play-Doh thing and stretchy. It's, just, it's very odd. Um, that's what they are. They're very stretchy bands of densely packed of this connective tissue. And because they're so densely packed, that means that blood supply to them is minimal. So there are going to be blood vessels that feed them, okay? But blood is our main supply. It's our highway. So what do you think blood brings? Main thing is oxygen and other nutrients. So that means we have to have oxygen and nutrients for things to heal, right? Why do you think your skin heals so fast? You got decent blood supply underneath it. Skin heals pretty fast. Muscles tend to take longer, but they're bigger. These guys are going to heal slow, so that's my unique thing, is when I tear or break or mess up a tendon or a ligament, those are injuries that linger because they heal slowly. They take a while to repair, and this is kind of why if someone's a, a professional athlete, if they have like an MCL, ACL, some of these tendon tears in their knee and stuff like that, they, they're probably done. Anyone remember, uh, what's the movie? Uh, Friday Night Lights. It's also a book and a show. Put booby in, let me spin. No? Anybody? All right, whatever. Okay. Anyway, Booby Miles tears his, I think it's his ACL, if I remember correctly. He's done. I mean, that he never is able to pivot and run like he was. He was like the best running back in the state in the 80s, basically. He was done after that. His whole career was going to be a professional football player. That was over from that. It's because these don't heal very well, and they almost never heal fully. And so someone that plays professional sports, whatever it is, soccer, anything they have to run and do quick turns, they're done pretty much, okay, for the most part, even with modern technology. It's mainly because 
there's just not a lot of blood supply. They'll heal, but they may never heal right or fully. So um, that's unique about tendons and ligaments, and they fall into a category. You see the, the subcategory upon subcategory, right? Tendons and ligaments are dense connective tissue, a part of this fibrous line of connective tissue. They still are connective tissue. That's the most complicated from connective tissue is those. The rest is straightforward, thankfully. That's the most complicated, though. That's the hardest to know, and this is why I spent the time doing this this morning of going, like, put them in colors and put out. So what I do, this is how I would study it, right? I wouldn't read every word for word. I would just find a couple phrases to help me distinguish what this connective tissue is and where I would find it. And that's all you'd ever need to know about them, right? So find the stuff that's going to help you distinguish these. So like I said, unique things, right? Unique thing about the dense connective tissues is they're dense, they're tendons and ligaments, and they have a poor or very few blood supply, which means they heal poorly. Okay, that's unique. Adipose, mainly fat cells. Energy storage, conserves energy protection, very unique. Areolar, rubbery, connects everything for the most part, found in a lot of, almost everywhere. And reticular, very specific, found in lymph nodes and spleen, found in places that have a, need a lot of room for cells to grow and mature, like lymph nodes where our white blood cells, our immune cells are. So that summarizes those. Cartilage, I'm going to make it actually pretty simple. So cartilage technically, yes. Yeah, so that's how we heal, right? Our blood carries oxygen and nutrients everywhere. If you don't have blood supply, you're never going to heal very well. Does, um, bone, marrow bone marrow generates blood cells. Um, it doesn't really have anything to do with the discussion we're talking about now, but bone marrow generates blood cells. So bad bone marrow means I don't have enough blood cells usually. So bad bone marrow would probably be like a like a blood a lot of blood cancers leukemia and all those have a lot to do with bone marrow and how it's functioning uh cartilage i'm going to simplify it a little bit technically there's three different types of cartilage but i kind of think that it's not necessary it's one of those gray areas where i just don't see it that this is like really detailed already i don't think it's ne necessary you need to know all three types of cartilage i think it's just more that you find where do I find cartilage in general? So they tell us that cartilage is composed of these cells called chondrocytes. I don't necessarily think you need to know chondrocytes. But what are we describing cartilage? OK, cartilage, I'm going to run out of colors eventually, but whatever. Let's do like a pretty blue, or this blue, I don't know. Cartilage is um, really rubbery, very similar to our dense connective tissue. How else does the book describe it? Rubbery, uh, I'm trying to think. Rubbery, uh, flexible, that would be a word, flexible. Rubbery, flexible, connective tissue. And we're going to find this in places that need to be rubbery and flexible that can take a punch or have some stretch to them, that sort of stuff. So cartilage is mainly fine, you find in your ears, right? Our ears, our nose. Um, and our joints, usually. And I say joints like wherever a bone connects. So your elbow is a joint. Your knee is a joint. Your fingers all have a bunch of joints to them, right? Our spine actually technically has a bunch of joints. Another one that you think of where cartilage is found, what am I talking about spine? They're called vertebral discs. The disc of in between our vertebrae. So it's hard to see on this guy's spine. But if I just had a spine, you could see there's like this off-colored, kind of pale yellow in between the vertebrae. You see that in there? Those are cartilage discs. That's your vertebral disc. And so what that allows is to give my spine that movement it can do. Allow the flex. Allow me to jump and land and shock absorb, right? So my bones don't just smash against each other, OK? So our spine has these cartilage discs in between every vertebrae, so shock absorption, being able to bend and flex a bit, that sort of stuff. So cartilage is very rubbery and that sort of stuff. The unique thing about cartilage, though, is very similar to dense connective tissue, except 
Here's a star. No blood vessels. I'm running out of room. There is very little to no blood supply to our cartilage. So if that, if that meant that there's little blood supply and it meant that tendons and ligaments have a hard time healing, what do you think that means about cartilage? It ain't going to heal at all, Harley. So this is why back problems that have to do with the vertebral disc, bulging disc, and some other things, stuff that happens to cartilage means that <clears throat> it's not going to heal very well at all, if at all. So people that have chronic back problems, if there's anything messed up with their cartilage disc, it's a lot of trouble to fix. There's not much we can do. Things like, have you ever seen someone that's broken their nose before, right? They may have broken the bones in their nose, but they've also smashed up the cartilage. What happens to people that have a, a broken nose? Sometimes it doesn't always heal straight again. Have you ever seen that? I've smashed mine pretty good. My aunt always talks about that. Her nose is slightly off to her left, I think, or her right, from a broken nose when she was a kid. Because most of our front of our nose is cartilage. It doesn't heal properly because it doesn't have a great blood supply or no blood vessels, either way. So cartilage is very likely to heal, very poor healing, okay? So again, our joints too, you can see in that picture on page 80, which is, I'm, I'm going to get to eventually, but I was trying to keep this all in one place to make it simple. But... Page 80 talks about, if you have your book, it summarizes these in the three different types of cartilage based on where you find them. I just think you should kind of have a general idea of where I find cartilage all. So it shows this cartilage in the joints, basically where our two bones meet, okay? And you can imagine anywhere there's a joint. Again, a joint is where two bones are meeting up and forming a joint. Elbow, fingers, uh, ankle, all that stuff. Where those two bones meet, there's going to be some cartilage. If this is the end of each bone, my fist right here, there's going to be some cartilage called hyaline cartilage on the ends so that they, when they rub together, can you imagine bone is a tough material, right? Them rubbing together, that's called friction, right? So I want something smooth and rubbery like cartilage to kind of pad that and allow it to slide past each other without hurting myself. So that's hyaline cartilage. There's other types of cartilage. Again, there's vertebral cartilage, the stuff we find in our vertebral discs. That's fibral cartilage. And then elastics, usually our nose and ears. But again, I think it's a little bit of rabbit trail that you'd have to know all three of those. I just think cartilage, where do I find it? Joints, ear, nose, places like that. The rest of this, is, as you can see, is summarized on 80 in like two sentences. Bone and blood is pretty simple. They are connective tissue. Um, Blood typically is connective because it's not just, it's a tissue, really. Blood has, it's, has red blood cells, it has cells in it. It has fibers in it. It has platelets in it that aren't really cells anymore. It has proteins floating around in it. So blood is a, mostly a liquid, right? I mean, if you pricked your finger, it's going to drip blood. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a liquid. It's mostly liquid. But blood is a connective tissue in the sense that it has so many other components. It's not just water. It's so many other things. And also, always remember, blood is a connective tissue because blood goes everywhere in the body. Blood is like the big highway. Nothing really gets from one part of our body to the other unless it travels through blood, okay? There is no way for something to get from my toe to my chest or vice versa without blood being the culprit to get it there. Well, okay. We can talk about the lymphatic system, but that's a whole rabbit trail. We're not going to go down that rabbit trail. But that's pretty much how I look at blood as a highway. Um, Party ran. ran. I ran out of room. I tried, but I ran out of room. Highway. Um, nutrients. Blood is, a, again, is blood is a connective tissue because it's full of so many components. It's not just liquid. It's not just cells. It's so much stuff. So I just say full of just different components that make it a connective tissue. And I remember it's connective because it connects everywhere in the body, like a big highway. And then bone, I feel like kind of makes sense. Bone is a connective tissue because without bone marrow that's housed in bone, we wouldn't have new blood cells. And without bone, we wouldn't have attachment points for, right, for our ligaments and for attaching our muscles. And we wouldn't have any of this, okay? Because pretty much all of our, most of our skeletal muscles at some point are going to attach to bones somehow. 
And so just think of bone as connected because everything as far as muscles and stuff is going to have to attach to that, okay? I don't really have a good color for bone, whatever. I don't think it really. We'll go back to black or gray. That's why it falls in attachment of muscles and other connective tissue. I'm making this stuff up as I go. It's all for my brain. Read this too many times. So there's a big chart on page 81 that gives you all this of what we just did. But I think it's helpful for us to talk through it a little bit and walk through it individually just to keep it somewhat more concise. So again, summary is everything I have up here would be something I expect you to know. It is. So connective tissue has a bunch of subcategories. Fibrous, cartilage, blood, and bone. Fibrous can be loose or dense. Loose is areolar, adipose, reticular. Dense is tendons and ligaments. That covers the fibrous. Then I have cartilage which is rubbery, and I find that in a lot of places that need to be able to absorb impacts and maintain their shape. My spine, my ears, nose, my joints. Blood connects everything, carries everything everywhere, and blood is made up of more than just liquid, so that's why it's a, uh, a complicated connective tissue. And then bone does so many functions and connects a lot of the dense connective tissue to muscles and everything else, and so... That's why bone falls in the category of connective tissue. So I'd say the hardest part is keeping that fibrous and cartilage straight because there's a lot of categories there. But in, bone, and, bone and blood, the BB there, is just memorize, hey, that's in connective tissue. And it makes sense if you think about what blood does and what bone does for us. They're connecting so many things. They would make sense. They would call that a connective tissue, okay? And again, there's a chart on 81 that kind of summarizes these. If you want a snapshot, if you like looking at charts where it's like right in front of you, right? But that kind of summarizes everything. So I'm taking that down now. We're going to keep moving on. So maybe that's helpful. Maybe it's not. I don't know. But I'm trying to talk through it. This is how I would study it, honestly. I'd have a notebook that looked like this. That's how I'd study connective tissue. And I told you guys that last week on Wednesday, so... Connecting things, okay. So the last couple here of our tissues are pretty straightforward. We've talked about epithelial, we talked about connective. So kind of going forward. Oh, hold on. here you go, hold on. Here's a question for you. What type of tissue lies underneath almost all epithelia or epithelium and connects tissues and organs together? lies under almost all epithelium and connects a lot of tissues and different tissues and organs together. Here's your options. You got adipose, reticular, you got areolar, or you got dense connective tissue. That's your options. So some people are going, most people have gone areolar. You guys are listening. It is areolar. Correct. Adip and areolar, adipose, reticular are loose connective tissues. Adipose is fat. We found that around our stomach. We find it under our skin. So fat tissue is kind of found everywhere. Again, the bulk of it around our stomach, backside, like aka love handles to protect our kidneys. But we're going to find that everywhere. Areola we're going to find everywhere. And its main job is to help us connect some of the epithelium to other tissues. It's a big role. And the reticular is much more rare and loose. And then dense connective tissue would be tendons and ligaments, which really typically are connecting our joints, muscles, bones. They're not really associated with epithelium, which is what this question's asking. So that's why the correct answers are all are. So I'm, again, I'm skipping through these. Again, cartilage, rubbery, flexible. They use that word matrix again because it's like a fibers all connected together. You don't have to know that bone's called osseosis tissue. We're going to talk about that later. We're going to talk about bone so much. You're going to hate bone in a minute. And the blood, again, exists as, blood is a fluid, but they call it like this, this here, this liquid matrix, because what plasma is, is not just water with blood. Plasma is, like I said, 
proteins and fibers and platelets that aren't considered cells and other material in our blood that helps with blood clotting, helps fight off infection, helps with fluid balance, that sort of stuff. So blood is not just a water, it's not, it's unique. It's this liquid matrix basically, it's what blood is. So that summarizes the two most complicated of our tissues. Epithelium and connective are probably the most complicated. These other two are pretty straightforward, and where you'd find these is pretty straightforward. Nervous tissue is talked about at the very top of page 82, and there's really not too much I'm going to say about this because, again, we have a whole chapter dedicated to our nervous system. So nervous tissue, the first line in the book talks about it. A high degree of excitability and conductivity. So I look at our nervous system as like electrical impulses, okay? There may not be a lot of people in here that understand like necessarily how electricity works and let's be fair, I'm not the best at it, okay? It takes me a few times to wire up a light switch or a plug, but I look at the nervous system like the, our electricity in our house, right, okay? Our nervous system is all about sending signals, okay? Or you could look at it like the internet in your house or whatever, okay? Things, messages get sent electronically, you know, through electrical signals, okay? And you'll know that too if you ever accidentally touch something that's a hot wire, okay? I have, it doesn't feel good. Has anyone ever been shocked by anything before to that degree? Some people have. It makes your heart feel a little fluttery, and you're like, ah, okay, that sucked. Uh, it hurts, and it feels weird. But that's our nervous system. It's this electrical impulses that fire rapidly, okay? I look at it like a power grid in the neighborhood. All the electrical poles, <coughs> most of those are underground some now, but electrical poles running around the city, that's your nervous system. It's these connections that are electrical that are very fast. Communication very fast, rapidly. So conductive, excitable, electrical impulses, those are the words people use to describe the nervous system, okay? Um, as far as any other details, phew, we'll talk about it. The book basically says the ability of the nervous system is all about speed of communication. Again, you have to think about this. The, like literally right now, the way I'm talking, right? I had to think of it. Cognitively, I had to think of what I'm saying. That thought had to travel down neurons in different places to tell when to move out of my windpipe to vocalize. Had to tell my tongue and muscles in my mouth to move a certain way. This is all happening so fast that I can, I can think of something and speak it at the same time, which to me is wild. That's how fast our nervous system is though, okay? That's all I'm gonna say. Conductive, electrical impulses, rapid communication, that's our nervous system. We've got a whole giant chapter four, dedic or chap yeah, chap no, chapter four, that's not right, chapter 11, I don't know, unit four, that's what it is, dedicated to that, so we'll get to that, but that's, that's our third tissue type, so, so far again, epithelium, connective, that was very complicated, nervous, and then lastly here is muscle on bottom of page 82. Muscle tissue is pretty straightforward, okay? Muscle tissue has pretty much one job, to contract, okay? Muscle tissue has one job, to contract and relax. When muscle tissue contracts, it causes things to happen. For example, in our heart, when it contracts, it causes the heart to get squeezed, and that pumps blood. When my muscles in my chest um, contract, and um, they're causing my lungs to get big and wide and my chest to rise so I can breathe in, okay? So the job of muscle is pretty simple. It is just to respond by contracting and relaxing. Typically our muscle is responding to actually electrical impulses from the nervous system. So a lot of times our muscles are going to be in our um, and nervous system are very related. Typically our muscles don't do much without the nervous system sending signals to tell them to do it. But it's all about contraction, relaxing, okay? And I guess I look at the muscle system as the way the cells are designed. I need to get some rubber bands and just do that. I don't have a hair tie or nothing. I don't know, whatever. Rubber bands, if you, that's what our muscle basically is. Cells that look like rubber bands where it's like stretching and relaxing, stretching and relaxing, right? They're like a tension to them. 
If I pull a bunch of rubber bands like this and I let go, they snap and hit my hand. That hurts, but that's what muscle is kind of doing with its contraction relaxing. <coughs> so they tell us that muscle technically has three subcategories, and these are very easy to remember. <coughs> Excuse me. So skeletal muscle, what do you think that's all around? Our skeleton, our bones, right? So skeletal muscle, typically the muscles you think of, like the biceps and the abs, right? The pecs, whatever, the back muscles, okay? The, the lats, the traps, whatever, okay? Arnold, we get it. Pump you up. My pastor said, like, pump you up from the, one of the Arnold movies. I said, is he quoting Arnold Schwarzenegger out there? Is that? They said, yeah. I said, that's cool. All right. He's fun. So anyway, those are the muscles you think of, though, right? I'm going to pump you up, okay? That's the stuff. Those are skeletal muscles. They help move our skeleton. They help move us around. Um, you don't need to worry about striated or this stuff. About That's just describing what they look like, and that's what the pictures in the book on page 82 are doing. They're just saying, if I looked at these muscles under a microscope, they have this look to them, striated or intercalated disc. I find that useless knowledge, honestly. That's a nuts to know, really, I find. Unless you're doing some kind of research, I just find that knowing that what they look like under a microscope doesn't really help you tell the difference between any of these muscles, right? So I, the main thing I always remember with these muscles, skeletal is all about the skeleton. Here's the difference. Look at, notice this. This says voluntary, and the rest of these say involuntary. So the, I'll, let me, I'll come back to that point. Another muscle type is cardiac. Now, where do you find cardiac, you wonder? The heart. That's it. I only find this muscle type in the heart, okay? That's why it's named cardiac. So our heart has a unique muscle type that's not found anywhere else. I'm not going to cut a bicep and find the same type of muscle. It's going to be a different type of muscle for the heart. And then smooth muscle, smooth operator muscle over here, is also involuntary. But where do you think we find that? Any guesses? Stomach, yep. So our GI tract, our intestines, and our stomach all move, right? But we don't sit here, we'll talk about it. They all move to digest food. They all move to get food through there. Another place we'll find is actually our, our blood vessels. Our blood vessels, depending on what's going on in the world around us, are going to tighten up what they call constrict or get bigger, dilate. Right? If I take off running right now at a full sprint around this room, I'm going to need more blood flow. I'm going to need more oxygen. So I'm probably going to start breathing harder, and my blood vessels are going to react to that and try to increase blood flow, that sort of stuff. So our blood vessels have reaction, and that's where the involuntary goes. Voluntary, what does that mean to you, voluntary? Huh? You, you control. That's what I'm getting at. Voluntary means you control it. So your skeletal muscles are not going to be moving unless you have, your brain has thought of it and you are doing that, okay? Now, there's always stuff we do without thinking about it, right? Ticks and stuff like that. I'm not talking about that. There's also the ability, right, if I trip over this cord back here, which I do, and start to fall over, without thinking about it, I'll catch myself, right? Now, that's a little bit different. We'll get into that discussion in Chapter 10 about muscles. We have, we have reflexes. But overall, skeletal muscle in general is controlled, okay? So if I don't, you know, say, wave your hand around like a crazy person, right, it's not just going to do this willy-nilly. Again, unless I have a disease, we're talking Tourette's through some kind of disorder that causes muscle spasms or causes that problem. But general normal conditions, it's voluntary. I make that decision to do my, wave my hand around like that. The other stuff I don't control. And thank the Lord, right? Because you, you imagine if you had to think about every time you had to beat your heart, we wouldn't, none of us would have made it here, right? None of us would be here because we would have looked at, you know, Instagram and then uh, croaked, okay? But the same thing we had to think about every time we breathe, okay? So, thank goodness that these are involuntary. It means that our, our cardiac muscles don't need control from the brain and they don't necessarily need our cognitive thinking to control them. Now, all muscles are going to have some nervous system influence, but it just means we don't have to think about it which also means we can't think about it. There's no possible way for you to sit here and go, heart rate, I want you to increase by two beats per minute. You can't do it. Now, you could think about something that gets you mad, like your ex-girlfriend or boyfriend, 
and then your heart rate might go up, but that's not voluntary. That's an emotional response that's caused your heart rate to go up, okay? But you didn't, you didn't, th you didn't make, you didn't think heart rate go up and it goes up, right? There's no control over that. Same thing with our smooth muscle. Mostly found blood vessels, GI tract, uh, respiratory some, like in, internal respiratory inside our bronchioles. Again, we don't have to think about that. Involuntary. Could you imagine if every time you ate, you had to think about the whole process of like the four or five hours it takes for that food to make it all the way down to the other end? Ooh, that'd be taxing on your brain, right? So same thing. Smooth muscle in our GI tract is just moving all the time, helping us digest food, helping it move through that system. We don't have to think about it. So that's my key difference there for you guys. For the muscle, know the three types, which I think they're pretty self-explanatory. Cardiac, we know is in the heart. Skeletal, the name tells us where we find that. And smooth is kind of everywhere else. Other tubes, other things, things that are always moving, okay? Um, as far as, again, the striated, all the, the look of the muscle, who cares? I don't think that you are going to be looking at this stuff under a microscope that often, so let's not worry about it, right? Let's just worry about the key difference of where do I find them and then know for a fact that skeletal is the only voluntary one, okay? That's the key difference how I remember them. Skeletal is the voluntary one. It means I have control over it. Everything else is involuntary. I don't control that. Okay? Does that make sense? Got it? Okay. That's your tissue types in a nutshell. That's the four. Epithelium, connective, nervous, and muscle. Okay? And remember that bone and blood fall into connective. And because that makes sense as they connect everything. Okay? What is this? Is this a video or a picture? Oh, okay. <laughs> So I just summarized some of them again. But the most widespread and varied tissue in the body out of the big four tissue types. Yeah, we, we know this one, right? Connective. The key was, that's quoted right from the book. Most widespread and varied tissue in the body is connective. Connective, connective. A um, couple things to round out this chapter. Uh, tissue repairs on page 83, and there's discussion about membranes. So tissue repair, I won't spend too much time. I'll show the video a little bit about it, but there's no, I don't think you need to know the steps about tissue repair at all. Um, I just don't think it's that helpful. Most of us even have a general understanding of we have an injury, new tissue starts to build. There's usually a scab. That kind of, uh, what a scab is really, guys, is a blood clot, really, and if you want to summarize it, it's just clumps of dead cells and clumps of dried blood, and it just kind of helps clot off and keep the wound sealed, right? Because we all know that if we have a scab, right, and we accidentally bump it, right, or knock it off, what do we start doing? Bleeding again, right? So that's kind of, a scab just kind of helps clot it off. So there's nothing really to know too much about that. I think the big thing that I would talk about... Um, is the number three on this image right here. If you look in your book, the number three talks of, has a little text box there. talks about the new tissue that forms is called granulation tissue. Granulation tissue, that's in bold. Granulation tissue, okay? Um, that's the, what you would call new tissue as it forms because it's not, their cells are coming together and getting forming. What I'll make about tissue repair is that sometimes, not always, but a lot of times, it's possible for our body to try and heal faster. It will form these collagen fibrous tissues that are known as scar tissue, okay? The reason scar tissue matters a lot is it depends on where the injury is. If it's my skin, big deal. Chicks love scars, all right? No, I'm just kidding. I'm trying to be funny, all right? Some people like scars. I don't know. Whatever. Scars tell a story, though. There's a lot of cool rock songs about scars, you know, all right? But the rule of why I'm talking about scars, on our skin, not too big of a deal. But imagine this. Let me paint a scenario for you, right? And this is a lot of times what happens to people that have heart attacks. A heart attack is, we're not going to get all the way into it, but a heart attack, um, also known as a myocardial infarction, is injury to the heart muscle itself. And the problem with cardiac muscle, this is a rabbit trail that just helps explain scar tissue. Nothing you have to know. The rabbit trail is that scar tissue happens. When I injure muscle in my heart, a lot of times my, I cannot replace cardiac muscle tissue. Cardiac muscle tissue is unique. It does not regrow very well. 
And so to fill in the gap, my body will say, well, I can't have a hole here, so let me fill it with this collagen and these fibers. What is that? That's scar tissue. So if I replace healthy parts of my heart muscle with scar tissue, the thing with scar tissue is this. Here's the kicker with scar tissue. It retains no functionality of the tissue it replaces. Scar tissue is just a wad of fibrous connective tissue that does not do the same function. So this means there's a whole section of my heart that doesn't pump right because it's scar tissue. It doesn't get electrical impulses. It doesn't contract. It's not muscle. It's scar. So that's why sometimes if you guys have ever had a big scar, maybe on top of that scar you don't have, this, you don't have a lot of feeling or there's some numbness there. That's because the nerves haven't grown back. It's just scar tissue. There's nothing else there. And so the problem with scar tissue is it does not retain the function of the tissue it's replacing. So when I have scar tissue on organs and stuff, that could be bad news. That means that I'm losing functionality. Does that make sense what I'm saying? About so a lot of times, if it's a big injury, we're always going to have some scar tissue that comes with it. And how much of that tissue gets replaced and how much of the scar tissue can really affect functionality of organs and injuries and stuff like that. And that's kind of, that's the crux of us as humans is that our body can't regenerate some cells fast enough or regenerate them effective enough. And so to fill in the gap, it's just going to dump, dump fibers in there, into that area and make scar tissue. So that's the only big highlight I talk about tissue repair is that you know that if you hear scar tissue, that's commonly going to be a part of every injury we have to some extent. And scar tissue is useless in the sense of it doesn't retain the same functionality of the skin it replaces, okay? So that's why if I damage certain nerves, there's no fixing them. Replaced with scar tissue, but that doesn't function like a nerve. So this is why spinal injuries are a thing. I injure my spine and I damage those nerves that connect the, my legs to my brain. That connection is just gone. If replaced with scar tissue, there is no new neurons that grow. It's done, okay? Now, of course, we've had surgeries and technologies, and there's always like a, right, we can fix this, we can fix that with modern technology, but we can't stop the human body from making scar tissue. So that's always going to be around, and it's always going to be a factor, okay? What is he talking about here? Why are you so quiet? So that he's saying at the very top of that page on 83, tissue repair basically says, tissue repair, if it, when we damage something, it's always kind of this crux of regeneration versus fibrosis. Fibrosis is more about scar tissue filling the gap. Regeneration means that we, replace, we hurt our skin and the epithelium comes back. And then just kind of we're back to par. We're back to the level. There's always a combination of fibrosis and regeneration happening, and it just depends on the injury and, and your health and a lot of other factors, how much is going to be fibrosis, how much will be regeneration. So that's what he's talking about. But as far as I'm concerned, most of the time you're going to have some level of scar tissue. It's just how much, right? How much am I going to have? Scar tissue does not restore normal function. When a cut occurs in the skin, the severed blood vessels bleed into the wound. A blood clot soon forms. When the surface of the blood clot dries, it forms a scab. Beneath the scab, white blood cells begin to ingest bacteria and cellular debris. The healthy tissue surrounding the wound sends blood, nutrients, proteins, and other materials necessary for growing new tissue to the damaged area. The newly formed tissue is called granulation tissue. Fibroblasts in the granulation tissue secrete collagen, which forms scar tissue inside the wound. The surface area around the wound generates new epithelial cells. These cells migrate beneath the scab. Eventually, the scab loosens and falls off to reveal new functional tissue. So when a cut occurs in the skin, the epithelium regenerates while the underlying tissue heals by fibrosis. And basically the picture in the image is saying that typically, we're gonna have more scar tissue at the connective tissue level on Lolly when they're looking at skin. But again, if we're talking about areas that are mainly connective tissue, like those dense ones, tendons and ligaments, they don't already have, they're just gonna most of the time heal by that fibrosis. They're gonna heal with scar tissue, so they become less functional. 
less stretchy, whatever. They're not going to be as functional. So there's always a risk when I injure something. Uh, so membranes is the last big discussion on this chapter. It's page 84. Um, and membranes, the definition the book gives us is basically sheets of tissues. Um, think of membranes as things that surround a lot of our organs or help kind of connect our organs to the rest of the body. Or they surround some of the cavities. Remember the cavities, the thoracic cavity, abdominal pelvic cavity, like these areas. So all membranes are is just the series of sheets of tissue. Like um, not a sandwich wouldn't be a good design. I don't heard a good uh, analogy. Cooking sheets? I don't know. I'm not a baker. I don't know. Sheets of tissue, okay? Again, like layers of tissue that are real thin that can kind of come together. So you'll see why it's going to make sense. So they break them up into two categories, epithelial membranes and connective tissue membranes, which I don't think that matters too much, but it just tells you that some membranes are made of epithelium for whatever reason. I would say that most of that reason would be depending on they need to be a little thicker. Connective tissue might just mean they need to be more flexible and they don't have to be as thick. So things like our mucous membranes, that sort of stuff. That's gonna, these are all the ones up top. What this picture on top of this picture that's in the book on 84 mainly is talking about, it's, or not mainly, it's talking about our epithelial membranes, which is the most common membranes to think of, okay? So mucous membranes, it's pointing to our nasal cavity and our mouth. That's, mucous membranes is pretty much around there. Lips, oral, nasal cavity, mouth, into the esophagus and our trachea, that area, okay? Those are all mucous membranes because they produce a mucus. Another name for our skin we're about to learn in chapter 6 is called the cutaneous membrane. And I always remember that because I always forget what a cuticle is, but I know people talk about cuticles or something. You know, like your, I don't know, your, uh, med or your whatever you call them. Yeah, whatever, cuticles, I don't know. Like your TikToker that does makeup or whatever, those, those people, those weirdos. All right, so... Uh, <laughs> Shots fired. I don't know. Whatever. Listen, you can do whatever you want for a job, but that's not one. All right. So, I'm just saying. I respect my YouTube people more. I'm just saying. It's more work. They actually make videos that are long format. They edit. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not getting on a rabbit trail. I hate the short form content. It's stupid. Anyway, I think it, it, it's bad for humanity, honestly. That's what I think. It's bad for us. It creates short attention spans. Um, people that think satisfaction needs to be immediate, that sort of stuff. I'm just saying. So that's not how it works. You got. You should write a twenty. You should have to watch a twenty minute review video and get to the end to get the conclusion. That's what you should do. All right. Or listen to an article. If you don't want to read it, listen to it. You know. Don't just watch something that you know one of the presidential candidates said out of context and not fact check it and think that's truth. Anyway, I won't go down that rabbit trail. Lord have mercy. Yeah. Yeah, that's the problem with short form content, is it not? If you take something out of context, it doesn't mean anything, okay? Like, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible I can take out of context that sounds really dark, but it's not the context of what's going on. So, anyway, context matters. Cutaneous membrane, that's your skin, okay? Another one that is, I think is worth highlighting there is a pair, some of these ones on the right hand side. They call these three, these, these on this side right here are the big ones. These are called, um, they call them uh, uh, serous membranes. Serous membranes is kind of like the highlight for me. So serous membranes, basically we're talking about they're like two layers, usually with a fluid in the middle. Now why is that? That's interesting. So look at these membranes though. Pericardium, the membrane around our heart. What does a heart do all day, every day? It beats, right? It beats. The membranes around our lung is called, this is, I should know, I should write on this side to keep up with the theme. Around the lung is pleura. Pleura is another one that's double layered. It's a serous membrane. That's why I have the two pieces of paper, okay? So, Imagine these two pieces of paper are these sheets of these serous membranes. If I had no liquid on the inside, if I just start rubbing this paper together like this, you know what happens? Friction. A fire, maybe. Well, I don't think a fire, but you get the point, right? 
I don't think I can do it fast enough. But friction, it gets warm, right? If my heart beats 60 beats per minute every minute my entire life, that's a lot of expanding contract. So that's a lot of movement of the membrane on the outside, right? That'd be a lot of friction. So my organs that move a lot, like the heart, the lungs expanding, they have a serous membrane that's two layers with liquid in the middle called serous membranes so that the liquid helps these two layers slide past each other a little bit and less friction, reduces friction. So that's what serous membranes are. The other one's called peritoneum. So those are my big three from this. These serous membranes, Perit uh, peritoneum, pericardium, pleura, the three P's, all right? Pericardium's around the heart, pleura around the lungs, and peritoneum encases pretty much the whole abdominal cavity. Um, and that has a lot to do with holding the abdominal, all the intestines and other stuff in place. But it also has a lot to do with the movement. Those move a lot. I don't know if you know this, but our intestines do do a decent amount of movement because they're moving food. Now, they're not jumping around like the heart and the lungs are, but they do expand, contract, and flex, okay? So the big one is that number three in the book, page 84, the serous membranes, these guys, the three Ps, pleura, pericardium, peritoneum. Have an idea where those are, only because those are going to come up again later, and I want you to already have a decent idea of where I'm talking about, okay? When we talk about the heart, we talk about the lungs. Um, and the connective tissue membranes is at the bottom of the page. We'll actually talk about that with unit two and some of the muscles and stuff like that, so don't stress too much about that. But if you hear a membrane, you're thinking sheets of tissues, like what I'm talking about with sheets of paper, and then some of those are just like a single sheet that's thick, cutaneous, mucus. Um, some of those are serous, where they have double layers and some fluid in the middle. And you think of any organ that moves a lot, you're going to find a serous membrane around it. Those are the big three that we're all going to find, though. Um, I have some words that are worth highlighting on page 85, just for future reference. There's a little green section on page 85. None of the life lesson ones. Little green box it says fast fact. You see that? Has two bold words: necrosis and gangrene. Some of you probably heard those, right? Yeah, yeah I'm sure most of us have heard those. Um, I want to highlight the difference between the two. Necrosis is what the book defines irreversible cell death or injury, okay? Irreversible means it, I can't fix it, okay? This would be like a heart attack that kills some of my heart and it gets replaced with scar tissue. That could be necrosis. Necrosis is typically associated with like something happens and I don't have oxygen feeding a tissue somewhere and therefore necrosis happens. So typically necrosis is going to be associated with lack of oxygen. So heart attacks, um, bat, blood um, vascular or arterial disease that cuts off flow to extremities, stuff like that. An injury that causes at necrosis is lacking nutrients, oxygen, and the cells die completely, complete tissue death. Gangrene is also referring to tissue death. Stay with me here, okay? That's why it's confusing. Gangrene is basically two forms, okay? Gangrene is very similar to necro necrosis, very similar. That's why I'm highlighting them, very, very similar. Gangrene is usually associated with cell death, okay? Mainly, specifically, due to bad blood flow. Now, necrosis can be kind of any, look at it this way. Necrosis is saying any cell injury, any cell death. Gangrene is saying specifically what's called dry gangrene. It's specifically saying cells have died, due to lack of blood flow, lack of blood supply. It's specific to that. Necrosis is more overarching. Most of the time, it's, they're related. They can be same. And most doctors, if you ask them, will use necrosis and gangrene interchangeably. So it's a hard argument to say there's a difference. But the main difference is, to me, how I've read and how I've read in the fast, necrosis is talking about just kind of any general cell death and injury. Gangrene is focused on cell death or injury due to blood supply being not there. But if you notice this, they break it up into a dry, and everyone's favorite word, moist. Does people still hate that word, or is that a meme? I don't remember. I know some people hate that word, moist. You call it wet. Call it wet if you want. <laughs> wet gangrene, moist gangrene. The difference between dry and, and moist gangrene or wet gangrene is that gangrene that is wet is involving an infection, usually a bacterial infection. Dry would be... 
like that. So I'm telling you that is like a, hey, highlight these. I won't say that I won't. I'll probably ask you something very basic about that. Like, what do you call cell death or injury? And you're going to have an option that just says necrosis or like, that's bad. You know, this, it'd be very straightforward, okay? But I'm just highlighting that so you've heard these terms before. Everyone kind of, again, synonyms, gangrene and necrosis, people tend to relate them, and they are very relatable. But true gangrene is usually related to lack of, ox lack of blood supply, and true moist gangrene means it was related to infection that caused it. So gangrene will happen a lot with people that have um, diabetes or people that have other vascular diseases that cause issues in their extremities for the most part. Um, We'll go down a rabbit trail about diabetes at some point, but you have any cardiac issues and diabetes, you're cruising for a bruising, okay? And I mean like an injury. And I, I've seen it. I mean, I've seen toes come off in socks, okay? I mean, it's not helpful, but I would say asthma and diabetes would be less relatable. Asthma is more associated with the airway specifically more isolated to that asthma doesn't have too much of an effect on general like systemic body it's more localized to the lungs which is still a problem and requires treatment but i say most people with asthma if they have a regular maintenance inhaler um, or a regular some kind of regular medicine to keep airways from being inflamed and avoid allergens should be okay but as far as that related diabetes, I don't know a direct correlation. Diabetes is a more systemic problem because of the blood flow is everywhere, where definitely asthma is more localized and it's more, you can focus more on like kind of one problem.